and ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matthew Waite, professor for drone journalism, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, USA, and our host, Sarah Harmon. Hi, guys. <laughs> Thank you for staying. Thank you for not leaving. I promise you won't be disappointed. Our next speaker is a professor of drone journalism, which, let's be honest with ourselves, in the media world is basically like being Superman. It's pretty much the coolest job you could have. Um, this is not just a guy with a cool job, though. This is someone who's won an award you've probably heard of. It starts the P. It's pretty much the best prize you can get if you're a journalist. The Pulitzer, he did that for a fact-checking website. He helped develop. It's called PolitiFact. It's a U.S. website that fact checks politician statement. And as you can imagine, it's getting a lot of use this election season. I know everyone really wants to hear about the drones. So without further ado, please welcome the founder of the world's first lab for drone journalism, Professor Matthew Waite from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Thank you. I was just, um, was just explaining that at this moment right now, I'm not, I'm not a nervous person. I'm really not. I don't have problems flying, driving. I enjoy stressful things. It's not a big deal. But about two years ago, I gave a talk where the whole point of it was to fly a drone around for a minute and then talk about the sound that it made. And I set it down, and I went to turn it on, and nothing happened. And I panicked because I now had 15 minutes to fill talking about a sound that nobody in the room heard. And so I paused, and I breathed, and I pushed the button again, and it came right on. So thank, thank goodness. Um, what I want to talk about today is uh, drone journalism. And I'm often fond of saying that I'm not smart enough to do complicated. So drone journalism, very simply, is using small unmanned aircraft like this to gather photos, video, or data for journalism. Doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. However, the definition may be simple, nothing else is. And just let me give you an idea of what happened to get this device here right now. When Deutsche Welle called me up and said, would you come talk at our conference? I said, absolutely, I'd love to. And they said, would you bring a drone? And I said, okay. They said, great. They were excited. Then the event staff heard what was happening. So now security is involved. Lawyers are involved. Building insurance. We have a national symbol behind us here. First thing they said, please be careful with the eagle. I'm not too worried about that. That looks pretty durable. It's going to be all right. Um, I flew this device over 12 million year old fossils encased in volcanic ash that was still freeable. That if I got low enough over it, it would create a cloud that was just amazing. If I had crashed that in there, I would have destroyed priceless artifacts. I doubt I'll even scratch the paint on that one if things go wrong. But on the Deutsche Welle side, we have lawyers, we have building security, we have insurance, we have bosses, we have meetings about this. On my side, I have to consult my university because we have to have insurance. More lawyers, more insurance companies. I had to, con I had to contact the United States federal government to ensure them that I was not bringing military-grade secrets here, that this did not violate import and export controls that I had no idea existed before I started this job. Um, for the first time in all of my travels with this drone right here, I was not searched at the airport for the first time. So thank you. I didn't get violated by a stranger. Um, every time I fly, I, well, I shouldn't say that. When I have the drone, it's every time. When I don't have the drone, it's about 50% of the time I am randomly pulled out of the line for additional screening. All of this adds up to one simple conclusion. We have all seen too many movies. We have a very 
overblown idea of what this device right here is. It is a three pound hunk of plastic. That's what it is. It will fly for about 20 minutes. It will carry a camera. That's what it does. It is no more sinister than that. But I do want to show you, I did drag it an awful long way not to fly it in here. So I am going to do the thing that makes me really, really nervous. And hopefully by talking about it, it'll be OK. It's going to play a little song. And I'm going to wait for it to just cycle through some things on board. And in a moment, I'm going to unlock the props. And it's like starting the car. It just goes into idle. And then I am the only thing that I am allowed to do, the only thing that I am allowed to do in here is go straight up and straight down. So I'm sorry if this is a little underwhelming. There'll be no loops, no flying around. I absolutely cannot go over anyone's head. That has been forbidden, which is too bad because it's a little warm in here, and this thing will kick off quite a bit of wind. So there it goes. Thank goodness. And we're off. And I realized something. And all my nervousness, we had originally planned to turn on the camera. I should do that. So, camera on. It's just a simple GoPro Hero 3 camera, nothing exotic. And now we're recording. So this is actually before, if you look at the video monitor, we flew it around in here when very few people were in here. We had a little bit of fun. And we're off again. Now in this very, very simple maneuver where I am gonna sure as heck stay in the middle of this blue dot on the floor here, you can already get the idea of why this is interesting. If you're a journalist, the ability to get a camera even 50 meters in the air makes a difference. And there's an odd wobble going on right now that I don't really like. Two lawyers on two different continents, two insurance companies on two different continents, and a whole lot of managerial heft to do that. No applause for that? Oh my gosh, come on. (laughs) So, one thing I want to make very, very clear, and this is something that I have to think about every single day. Let's get it out of the way right now. This is really cool. We're talking about flying robots. My inner child is freaking out every day that I get paid to do this. We're talking about a time in journalism when reporters will carry flying robots literally in a backpack. Here's the backpack. I bought it, I brought it in. It's got my laptop in here too. Well, actually, the laptop's right over there. It's got a bunch of other stuff in here. A journalist can literally have their own flying robot in their backpack. It is a glorious time to be alive. But let's also be very, very real. This is potentially dangerous. You, without noticing or even thinking about it, heard those blades get going, and your mind immediately went, hold on, that's vaguely threatening. Those are rapidly spinning blades, and they're in the room. I'm going to keep my eye on that. I'm going to make sure I know where that is. If you have ever been around lawn equipment or heavy machinery or something like that, when it makes a lot of noise, you instantly locate it, you know where it is, and you know how to avoid it and to stay safe. This is really no different. And one thing I tell my students all the time, an answer that always has to be on the list of possible answers is this is a terrible idea and we should not do it. That's always got to be a possibility. So I'm often accused 
and often I accuse myself of this too, that I basically come to these conferences to crush your dreams. I am here to tell you how difficult this truly is. You may be thinking right now, I have a credit card in my pocket, I have a smartphone, Amazon.com is a thing, I could have this thing delivered to my home in a matter of days. And that's true, you can. And if you, private citizen, not journalist, private citizen, want to fly it in almost every country on the planet, the answer is, go ahead, it's fine as a private citizen, as a hobbyist, as someone who just is interested in making things fly, it's okay. If you are not that person, things get vastly more difficult, and they get more difficult all over the world every day. I think you can see the power in this immediately. This is a purpose-built machine for providing context, for providing a different view of an event. If you, uh, if you have ever covered a large-scale natural disaster from the ground as a journalist, you know it is exceedingly difficult to describe what is going on. You look one way, it's destroyed. You look another way, it's destroyed. You look straight ahead, it's destroyed. Well, which way is more destroyed than another? In a large-scale disaster, journalists can take days, weeks even, to figure out exactly what went on, to be able to tell the story of what happened. The reason I got into this was I was at a mapping conference in Southern California with about 22,000 of my closest mapping nerd friends. It was an absolutely enormous conference. And I saw a Belgian company called Gatewing that was selling a product called the X100. It was a fixed-wing aircraft about that big, about that wide, about that long. It had a camera in the bottom of it. And somebody with a tablet computer walked out into the field. They drew a rectangle around the area they wanted photographed. They indicated where they wanted the aircraft to take off from, the area that they wanted the aircraft to land. They put it on a catapult, and <laughs> off it went. And it flew back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth across that area. And it came in and landed. And they pulled the memory card out. And they put it in the tablet computer. And it immediately stitched all of those images into a high-resolution composite map of the ground, of that field, at that moment. But because it also had oblique angles, it had other views of the ground, it extracted 3D features. So suddenly you can see terrain, you can see land elements, you can see rocks, you can see all kinds of things. And I was astonished. I immediately ran up to the guy on the floor and I handed him my wallet and I said, I want that one right there. And he laughed and he said, they're $65,000 each and oh, by the way, they're completely legal in the United States. That was 2011, nothing has changed, but I had been told that things are going to change soon. This is when I learned the difference between United States government soon and my idea of soon, and they are wildly different. This purpose-built perspective machine, this one right here can be all yours for about 1,200 American dollars. A better, slightly larger one with a slightly better camera, more about 3,000 American dollars. A manned helicopter in the United States costs $1,500 per hour to operate. This device, after your upfront cost, you're talking about zero cost. You can amortize the insurance, which is not expensive over a long period of time. The cost to power the batteries is not all that much. It's zero. So $1,500 an hour recurring or $1,500 once. That's a pretty substantial economic argument. And it's a substantial economic argument that is winning over more than just journalists. Developers, uh, infrastructure managers, golf course managers, those are my favorite. Farmers, agriculture is going to be the largest industry to use drones by a long, long way the world over. Journalists are going to be a tiny, tiny, tiny little speck in this industry. But we're an important one, and I'll talk about that in a second. That's the upside. The downside 
for drone journalists is that this is an area of law, of policy, of regulation we are wholly unaccustomed to dealing with. Unless you work for a very, very large broadcasting organization that has a helicopter, you've never seen this before. This is very, very different. Um, I never understood what the term highly regulated industry really meant until I got into aviation. We are talking about issues of safety that journalists are unaccustomed to dealing with. Most of the time when we're talking about safety, we're talking about physical safety. We're talk talking about a journalist that's going to uh, cover soccer riots in Marseille, and there's flying bottles around, or tear gas, or you're going to a combat zone where the dangers are, are fairly obvious and well-known, and, and any more not obvious and not well-known. Um, this is a different kind of safety. We're talking about rapidly spinning blades. We're talking about basic physics. What goes up must come down. And if this thing comes down in a crowd, someone's getting hurt. There is no ethical journalism that ends with people being maimed. And so we have to consider what we're going to do to uh, deal with safety issues. And globally, everywhere, we have yet to thread the needle. We have yet to figure out how a flying robot with a camera is going to affect our property laws, how it's going to affect our privacy laws, and within journalism, how it's going to affect our codes of ethics. All of this can be summarized thusly. It's all the French's fault. They did it. We can blame them. Any French people in here? I'm sorry if you are. My bad. Um, so in 1783, there were two guys in Paris who I can only imagine were crazy, straight up nuts, because they thought it would be a great idea to put a bunch of hot air into a bubble and float up into the sky. They thought this was such a great idea that they demonstrated it for the king of France. If you're going to do something, you might want to test it out a couple of times before you go before royalty and do it. Nah, they're good. In the moment that they roll, they floated up into the sky, everybody around was amazed. People were flying. Oh, my goodness. Lawyers, on the other hand, went, hold the phone. Wait a minute. Stop. Isn't that person trespassing right now? Prior to that moment, our idea of property law came from the Romans. And it said, he who, he who owns the land owns the skies to the heavens above. Which is pretty easy to do when you're a Roman and no one can fly. It's not a big deal if you give away all space on into the ends of the universe above you. It's not really a problem. But in that moment... When hot air balloons became a thing, lawyers began asking questions, as they tend to do. One of the funniest things, sort of a historical footnote, one of the first legal battles over flying was actually between the Germans and the French about whether or not you can cross national borders as you're flying. Was it okay? Because suddenly we had to argue about, was there national sovereignty in the skies? We didn't know. We just honestly didn't know. So for centuries after that moment, lawyers argued, but no cases anywhere were ever tried about whether or not you're actually trespassing in the sky. Most of the time, the argument goes like this. Are you trespassing if you're in the sky? Well, in order to trespass, you have to be on the property denying the owner access to that spot. If you hang out a hundred meters above your property, I would like to talk to you because you have a superpower and can fly. Most people do not float somewhere a hundred meters above their property. So can you trespass? Most of the time the argument goes, no, but maybe, uh, I don't know. The only real answer that we got actually has to do with dead chickens. And it happened in the 1940s in the United States. 
In the 1940s, the Army Air Corps, the predecessor of the U.S. Air Force, was buying up runways all over the country for the war effort. And they they bought one in North Carolina, and they extended the runway right up to the front door of the Cosby's chicken farm. And then they began landing bombers on that runway day and night. A World War II era bomber is loud. It is a clattering, thundering machine. And it was landing no, no higher than 83 feet above their house day and night. The couple almost went crazy. The chickens actually did go crazy. They started smashing themselves against the walls of the chicken coop to put themselves out of their own misery. They committed suicide. Those that didn't kill themselves by smashing themselves to death quit producing eggs. They quit eating. They slowly starved to death and died. The, the farm collapsed. The farm could no longer go on. They sued. They sued the federal government. And in what legal scholars consider one of the worst Supreme Court opinions in the history of the country, a Supreme Court justice at the last minute rewrote the opinion and said, okay, we can't have aerial trespassing. Because if we have aerial trespassing, then all of this airplane stuff goes away. So we can't have that. But if you're flying really low over somebody's property, then you're a nuisance. And if you create such a nuisance that you cannot enjoy your property anymore, then you have taken it away from somebody. And that's how we have our modern air system, is nuisance, is noise. The reason why you right now do not have very low-flying airplanes right over your property has more to do with noise than it does with your ownership of that property. And you can thank the Cosby's chickens for that. So that got us to the 1940s. It wasn't until the 1980s that in the United States we had our first landmark free press case that said if you take a photograph from the air, from a certain altitude in the air, then it is as if you took it on a public street. If you can see it from 500 feet in the air, then it's public. And it was actually an environmental case that that came from. Since then, we have had no other cases. We have had nothing else to deal with this issue of aerial trespass. We have had nothing to do with establishing how high you control over your property. I was even looking it up in uh, in German law today. Germans have no idea. There's some magical point in the air that you do control, but nobody agrees on what it is. And it really comes down to, again, nuisance, whether or not you're, you're causing yourself a nuisance. In 1903, when the Wright brothers took off from Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, the world was absolutely agog. Their mouths wide open. We were amazed. We had achieved motorized flight. The United States federal government immediately said, oh no, we want absolutely no part of regulating airplanes. That is for the states to decide. As a nation, we are not going to do anything about that. And they didn't. They let every state in the United States come up with their own rules. Everyone did it slightly different. Everyone required a different license. It was chaos. It wasn't until 1922 that we started pulling these things together. And it really wasn't until much later that the world started dealing with aviation on a global scale. There are now agreements between every nation. This is why you can fly from one country to another and why a pilot from one country can fly to another country. There are agreements in place that basically set up a standardized set of rules. It only took us just shy of 100 years to come around with that, but we did it. Yay us. Drones have arrived, and everything that we have done to screw up aviation since the Wright brothers in 1903, we are doing it again. And we seem to have not learned from our history. Every nation has their own rules, Even political subdivisions within nations have their own rules. Many states in the United States have passed their own rules. They're different at some invisible point in the landscape. Um, There is not a common European policy. Every country in Europe has their own. Uh, There are many countries in the world that have nothing. That just, you've either said they're all banned, you can't fly them at all, or they've just said, we have got bigger problems to solve. Just forget about it. One country that I know of, Brazil, has said, we want 
a drone industry here, so we're not going to pass much in the way of laws at all. So just come on down and do your thing. Have at it. So many, many nations have gone very far with this, um, but none of them have dealt with this issue of private property. None of them have figured out how privacy is affected. Some come closer than others, but we've never had cases. We've never had somebody prosecuted. We've never had these things in a court of law where facts can be ascertained. So we have more regulations. They're not standard. They're difficult to follow. They're complex. We have few, if any, countries that have addressed this in privacy and in property. And we've brought the price down so that pretty much any journalist in any part of the world can have one. What could possibly go wrong? I'll tell you exactly what could possibly go wrong through my own personal examples. Um, in 2011, I started the Drone Journalism Lab at the University of Nebraska. I figured since I could buy one of these off the internet, how complicated could this be? Oh, was I wrong. We got a grant from the Knight Foundation. We found partners on campus who already had UAVs and were already using them, so we thought, hey, this is already... We can do this. This is great. In that time that we were fundraising and in that time we were finding partners, there was a terrible drought in the state of Nebraska, historic drought, um, worse than any prior to that. We went out on a major river in the middle of the, of the state that goes dry in the summer. It's not unheard of for it to go dry, but it went dry the entire summer, which is really unusual. All we did was we went out, we flew about 300 meters in the air. Actually, no, I take that back, 118 meters in the air, about 300 some odd feet. Um, looked down the river, turned around, looked up the river, came right back down. We went to a different spot in a much more rural location. Went up, did the same thing, came back down. That's it. Eight months later, we got a letter from the Federal Aviation Administration, a cease and desist order, an order from a regulatory agency in the United States government that said, shut down or you will be prosecuted. If you ever have the chance to get one of these letters, I highly encourage it. It's exhilarating. Because you think, oh God, I'm going to prison. I'm joking, I'm really joking. It was scary, I about wet my pants. And when I started breathing again about 15 minutes later, um, I called our lawyers and was just I was speaking gibberish into the phone. And they were like, please, stop. Take a deep breath. What's going on? And I explained it to them. They said, well, call the FAA. So I called them up, and I said, well, what's going on here? They said, well, you're a, you're a state university. You're a public university. So we consider you part of the government. You have to get permission that the government has to get to fly that device. And they said, it's not hard. It takes a little bit of time. It's a little bit of paperwork. And they said, but it's, you'll get it. It's not a big deal. They made it sound like it's no big deal at all. I'm like, awesome. This is great. So oh, I'm not going to prison. Awesome. Their idea of a little bit of paperwork took a year to complete. And at the end of that year, right as we are about to submit our application for government permission as a journalism school, which still to this day leaves a terrible taste in my mouth, they said, we've changed our minds. You're not part of the government anymore because you're an educator. And education is not a government function. Uh, hold on, what? We've been a state institution since the mid-1800s. What do you mean we're not a government function? I said, nope, you're not. So your only option now is to become a commercial operator. Okay, what does that mean? Well, you've got to get a different kind of permit from us. And in order to get that permit, you have to be a licensed pilot. Hold, hold on. You want me to fly a manned aircraft in, in the air so that I can fly a three-pound hunk of plastic on the ground? Yep, that's what we want. So... Guess what I did last summer? I am a licensed manned aircraft pilot 
if you should ever need to fly somewhere, <laughs> it cost $8,000. I didn't pay for it. Somebody else did. So it's all right. I wouldn't have done it that way. My wife would have freaked out. She wasn't really happy about this anyway. She knows how I drive. She doesn't want to see me flying an airplane. She's gone on precisely one flight with me. We flew around the airport, down to our house, and back. And I have never in my life seen her more terrified than I have at that moment. And she's had major surgery and had two children. And she, that was like a walk in the park compared to this. So, but I am now a manned aircraft pilot so that I could get permission to fly that thing on the ground. The paperwork for this is now at, uh, actually, what day is it? We are at nine months and counting now, as of yesterday, that we are waiting on the FAA to just sign a piece of paper that says, yep, you're good, go ahead. Unfortunately, I offered a class in drones in January, figuring we would have this by now, and we didn't get it. And so students that I said, we're going to learn how to fly drones in here, only ever got to fly them inside. And they were sort of upset about that. So the rules in the U.S., quite literally, are being made up as they go along. Because in the U.S., there are no regulations that deal with drones. The way that they have decided there are regulations is by a little bit of a trick. I was in Paris this last week, and I was astonished at the number of people that were playing the little cup game with the ball and getting people to give them money so they can lose it. That's essentially what the FAA is doing. They're moving the ball around in the cup and telling you to point at which cup you think the ball is in. They're trying desperately to come up with rules they haven't yet. In the meantime, what they have done is they have said, this is an aircraft. It is an aircraft the same as the Delta Airlines flight that I took here. It is the same as the aircraft that I learned how to fly and it is regulated as an aircraft. The permission that I have to get that I'm still waiting on is actually a list of, I have to give the FAA a list of regulations that I cannot comply with because I'm not flying a Delta Airlines flight and say, okay, I need out of these to let me operate. And they look at it and they say, okay, you can do that. For instance, as an aircraft, I am required to have an airworthiness certificate for this device. Airworthiness certificates on manned aircraft take 18 months. But not only am I supposed to have an airworthiness, certif airworthiness certificate, that airworthi airworthiness certificate has to be in the cockpit with me, has to be in the pilot seat. It has to be at my right leg in the pilot's chair in the aircraft. Anyone see the pilot's chair in this thing? It's a little bit difficult to sit on. You don't go anywhere if you try. Um, so that's how things are regulated in the United States. Interestingly enough, it's somewhat similar here in Germany. In 2014, they decided the same thing. That's an aircraft, but hold on. It's not like other aircraft. So they came up with rules for this. I have been told that civil aviation authorities around the world are like teenagers at a fashion show. They are looking at everybody else, and they are copying everyone else. And unfortunately, the United States tends to drive things on this. In most countries in Europe, you do actually have to have a pilot's license, but they have a drone-specific license that you can get. You have to demonstrate your ability for an for a aviation official which basically means you do what I just did in here. You get up off the ground, you do a couple of turns, you bring it back down, you show them that you're not an idiot. You sign a piece of paper that says you have insurance and that you accept that you are responsible for other people's safety when you fly this, and that's it. You go on with your day. The difference between most countries in Europe, actually most countries on the planet and the United States is you may have to follow a lot of rules, but you will eventually get to yes. You will be allowed to fly it, and you'll be allowed to use it for journalism. In the United States, that's an open question. There are only two news organizations, uh, three, excuse me, three news organizations that
that have gone through the process and gotten permits from the FAA and were actually allowed to fly them. So, like I said, um, civil aviation authorities are very, very fad conscious. They follow each other around. The United States tend to be the one that they copy the most. The United States, right now, is on the doorstep of releasing its much anticipated and long waited drone rules. And there is a belief that a lot of countries around the world are going to copy them, although most other countries have their own now. So I don't know if this will happen, but this is typically what happens. What those rules will look like, we don't actually know. Will they actually arrive this month? We do not know. The FAA said, yes, they will. The FAA would be the worst journalist on the face of the planet because they have yet to meet a single deadline ever ever if i blew deadlines like this agency i wouldn't have lasted 10 minutes in a newsroom so they say they're going to release in this month what do they look like they do away with the pilot's license you no longer have to have one but you do have to take a knowledge test you have to take a test of aviation knowledge to under so you understand what the rules are in some countries the rules make up a nine-page document. In Chile right now, the Civil Aviation Authority's rules for drones is nine pages. The rules for flying a drone commercially in Chile are, are you 17? For most of us, that ship sailed a long time ago. Can you read and write Spanish? They don't say how well, which is good for me because I'm terrible at Spanish. Will you sign a piece of paper that says you accept Risk and responsibility. Yes, yes, I can. And will you take a multiple choice question or a multiple choice test about civil aviation rules? It's similar here in Germany. Same test, similar in France. The United States will go that way as well. You can only fly during the day. Believe it or not, there are very strict rules about what day is and is not. Very specific. You can not fly over people. What that exactly means, we do not know. If you read it literally, it means I can't do this. I think that's pretty safe to assume that's a bad idea. But most countries have a, a halo around people of some distance. If you get a commercial license in the United States right now, that is 500 feet. In the UK, it's 167 meters. Different countries have different sizes of the halo. Most of them are realizing that's too far. Like, it really doesn't provide any, uh, any additional level of safety. Um, but what does that mean, flying over people? We don't know. Day flight, not over people. Um, and that's mostly it. You can't be right at an airport when you fly. If you're going to be flying near an airport, you need to notify air traffic control. Every country has a different set of rules about how far from the airport you can be. I believe in Germany, it's 1.5 kilometers. If you're within 1.5 kilometers of the airport, take a circle and draw it around, no. Otherwise, you're fine. The U.S., it's five miles. But under the new rules, you'd be able to notify the tower that says, here I am, here's what I'm doing. That's pretty reasonable. Under those rules, and under rules that other countries are, are considering, it is going to become much more possible to do drone journalism. That's um, both fantastic and also somewhat frightening. Our coverage of disasters is going to get immensely better. Our coverage of civil unrest, of soccer fights during the Euro Cup, will get better. We'll be able to provide people perspective on these things. We'll be able to show them what they look like. I'm not afraid of those stories. Those stories are easy. The, uh, they, the ideas are obvious. Where I'm worried is when do we get into sensitive stories with drones? An example I'll give you is a story that I covered as a reporter in 1999. I was a police and crime reporter in Little Rock, Arkansas, 
and I had a police scanner in my car, and a call went out to a murder. And it was very close to where I was at that moment. So I was the first person to arrive at this murder. And when I stepped out of my car, I looked down, and on the ground were three children. Their father had gotten high on drugs and beaten them to death with a rock. He believed that he was Jesus. So he laid his children in the shape of a crucifix on the ground. He then stripped all of his clothes off and ran, fled the neighborhood. A horrific crime. I stood there and I looked at those boys and I honestly can still see them today, right now, when I tell you this story. The other thing that I can remember is the next thing that I heard, which was a sound that I will only describe to you as the sound of pain. And it was these boys' mother who was in the front yard and had seen what happened to her sons. And she was on the ground on her knees wailing. I asked my students, would you use a drone in that situation? And their immediate answer is, no. Mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I say, well, hold on. What if you went back a ways behind some houses and some trees and you got up just a little bit in the air right above the treetops where you could see the property, you could see the police, you'd wait until they came and covered the bodies. But the way that those boys had been laid out, the detail, the time that the father had taken to lay them out was, was an issue at trial. It was a, it was a major detail of the story. In television, that's called an establishing shot. Get a wide look at the area. You could be up and down below that tree before anybody even knew you were there. Now my students are, oh, okay. But I want you to think about one thing. If I have one, that means every television station in town has one. That means every newspaper has one. That means every radio station has one. Every blogger, every gadfly, every freelancer, they've all got them. And instead of one, we have 15. And news is a competitive business. You're always trying to outdo your competitor. So it doesn't take a great leap of imagination to think somebody's going to scoot forward a little bit to try to get a little bit of a better shot. And someone's going to see that and say, nope, I'm going to move forward. And then it's tit for tat. Keep moving forward. And now you have 15 drones immediately above that grieving mother. There is no one in this room right now who is going to say to me, that sounds great. I like this idea. Let's do this. You wouldn't. It's horrible. It's horrific. You would not deny that mother her right to grieve. You would? Remember the sound. Remember the sound that the drone made. One of them made that sound in here. Now 15 of them are going off. The camera is quiet. And you can say a respectful distance back. Is it different? I think it fundamentally is. And I don't think that our decision making and our ethics codes have thought about the psychology of noise and how that is going to affect people. And that's where I begin to worry. A major news organization called me one day and said, we would like to take a drone to Syria, and we want to get video of refugee camps and show people how big they are. And I said, well, on one hand, I think that's a great idea. I don't think the world really truly comprehends the scope and the scale of the humanitarian disaster that's going on. However, have you thought that these are folks who are displaced by war? These are people who may not trust a flying device above their head. They may view it as a threat, and that threat could cause a panic, and that panic could kill people. And the phone went very silent, and they went, no, we hadn't thought of that. These are the things that I worry about. What do we do when the story is sensitive? What do we do when people might not react with wonder to our flying robot over our head. So for this drone journalism idea to become reality, for it to become something that all of us in this room use, that we see commonplace, we only have to rewrite 
our aviation laws around the world, we only have to rewrite our property laws. We not only have to rewrite our privacy laws, we have to rewrite our code of ethics in journalism. No problem. Easy, right? Maybe not. And with that, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Matthew. We have time for one or two questions. So if you can just throw your hands up, we'll try and get through them as quickly as possible. We'll start with you, sir. I'll be on the boat later, too. You can find me there. <laughs> Is that on? Try it again. Try again. Don't, don't turn anything on. Just, oh, just put it to your mouth. There you go. Yeah. All right. There we go. Uh, my name is Tofik Khalidi. I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, he said it cost you about $1,200. Yes. Is it up for sale? I'm going to <laughs> buy it and take it back home in Bangladesh. And uh, I'm sure these regulators in Bangladesh are not aware of the issues that you talked about. Um, we can talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, honestly, the aviation laws are so messed up that I actually have a bigger, better drone sitting in my office that I have yet to even fly outside yet. I haven't taken it out of the box, which is just heartbreaking. What? Yes. He's asking if it's safe to carry in an airplane. Weirdly enough, you can't check it. Um, at least in the United States, you're not allowed to because of the battery. The battery is a, a lipo battery, and they tend to burst into flames, so they want you to carry it on, so I guess you could put the fire out instead of down in the cargo hold. So I actually had to carry that backpack on board with me and carry it with me everywhere I've gone since we've been here. So yes, um, different countries have different rules. Uh, we've taken them to uh, Tanzania, Kenya, India, Turkey, Dubai, Chile, and Everywhere sort of behaves a little bit differently every time. Um, I ended up in the back room of the uh, airport security in Dubai, and they were going through everything, and I was kind of freaking out, and they ended up saying, oh, it's fine, go ahead. So <laughs> that was scary. Anyway. My, my name is Bilal. I'm an Afghan journalist based in Kabul, Afghanistan. Recently, the Afghan government banned the use of drone cameras by Afghan television networks. Mm -hmm because they were filming some demonstrations, and they said it's a threat to national security. What exactly do you think should be done um, to, to overturn the decision? Um, any advice, suggestions? Thank you. That's a tough one, because there's a substantial question about press freedom and drone regulation. If there are some in the United States who believe that every drone flight should have a flight plan, and that flight plan should be approved by the Federal Aviation Administration. Absolutely impossible. It will never happen. But that puts the Federal Aviation Administration in the position of approving or disapproving of the journalism that I do. They could decide, story to story, what journalism I got to do with a drone. And that is anathema to a free press. That is not a free press. Um, I think the issue here is more fear than it is logic. And the argument that I would make is, okay, there are sensitive places in the world, in your country, in this town, that we shouldn't fly over. We can just agree. We'll agree that flying near or over a military base, fine, we're not going to do it. Um, maybe around a shrine or a mosque or a, a, you know, a holy place. Okay, we can all agree that's, not a, that's, that's a bad idea. And, and in that exchange, in that sort of, okay, we're going to set some ground rules. These are the things you're afraid of. We can operate in other places and it's not a threat. Then that's the balance you end up achieving. Where I don't want to end up is a place where the government gets to decide who is a journalist and what journalism do they get to do? A lot of, a lot of people have argued for a, a journalism drone license. And I'm like, absolutely not, because who is a journalist? The government gets to decide now? No, I'm not okay with that. But it's that balance. It's, de it's defining the places that you don't want, you, that they don't want you to go, and you have to sort of come to an agreement. Um, the initial agreement, I'm sure, is not gonna be the best one you're gonna get. 
it's not going to be good. You're not, it's not going to work perfectly. But it's at least something beyond a, a total ban. Total bans are unworkable. One more yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, hello. My name is Juan Montoya. Uh, I come from Medellin, Colombia. Uh, as we know, as Afghanistan, we come from countries with uh, some internal or, or war conflict. Yes. So I find it like very useful, for example, for the places that are filled with landmines and stuff for oh. the safety of the journalists. Certainly. But I have a question regarding the proximity. Let's pretend that the rules are okay and that you could fly your drone everywhere. Do you think that in a moment the drone can get the same perception and the proximity that a live person can get? Because I have the ability of improvising. I have the ability of understanding her feelings when I ask a question or to change the question. Or, But do you think in any moment it can achieve that proximity or, or is it still, because I know this is good for landscapes and yes. to show the general issue, but in a face-to-face -face conversation with people, I, I don't know if we ever a drone standing two meters would catch the same perception, you know? I, I don't think a drone is ever gonna replace a journalist on the ground. But the way that I would think about this drone, and I would think about all drones, is the same way that I think about this. That is a flying smartphone. That's all that it is. It's a camera, it's a tool. I can do some pretty amazing journalism by just doing this in this time. Now take this and let it fly. There's a difference between a journalist with a camera on the ground. There's a difference between human beings interacting and a flying machine. It has its use, it has its place, but we have to be clear, it's a tool. And that's all that it is. It's not a replacement for journalists. It's an extension of them. It's, uh, it's a different camera. It's a different tool. It's a long boom arm. It's uh, ability to sense something in the environment that is not visible with your eyes. Um, it's the ability to extend the perception of the journalist much farther. Um, in an area like you're talking about with landmines, it's a, it's a way to keep a journalist safe and still be able to witness something or see something. Um, but it is just a tool. Um, there was a session just right before this about algorithms replacing reporters, and they're not going to. Because an algorithm will never be able to ask the mayor about corruption. An algorithm will never be able to interview a mother about the loss of her children. Uh, I am convinced that the complexity of the human, of the human condition cannot ever be captured in a, in a computer. That thing is not ever going to be able to interview somebody without it being just weird and them not reacting the same way that they would with a human being. There will always be a place for a journalist. But now their reach is much further, and that's the important part. I can't think of a better note to end on. I know there are still questions, and to that end, I'd like to say the day in the plenary session is over. The Global Media Forum is not over. It continues. Matthew's going to be on the boat this evening. I encourage everyone to come. If you have a question that you didn't get to ask, that's a great moment over a drink to ask your question. Um, the boat will be leaving at 6.30 uh, from the river, which you, many of you, I think, can see out the window. Don't let the rain put you off. Let's have a big round of applause for Matthew Waite and for everyone who stayed till the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Many thanks to Matthew Waite and to all our guests today. And ahoy, ladies and gentlemen. As Sarah said, boarding time for the Rhine River dinner cruise is 6.30. You can get to the dock via the Rhine lobby behind the plenary chamber. The ship is scheduled to depart at 7.30, so don't be late. Have a wonderful evening and hope to see you later or tomorrow. <laughs>